Hi, this is Ryan Lawler. I'm here with TechCrunch TV. Today we're here with Arun Sunarajan, who is a professor at NYU's Stern School of Business. And you've been doing a lot of work and investigating uh, a topic that's kind of close to my coverage area, which is the sharing economy. Yeah. So um, why don't you tell me a little bit about uh, you know, what, how you define the sharing economy and why it's so important um, right now? Okay, yeah, it's good to be here. Um, well, I, I guess I'm really fascinated by the sharing economy because um, I see it as um, a process by which, um, you know, real world assets, mm -hmm. um, things that were outside the scope of digital disruption, things outside the scope of music, video, publishing, mm -hmm. um, these assets are being sort of disaggregated in space and in time. Mm -hmm. So you've got time slices of an apartment, you've got sort of space components of an apartment or of a car or of a you know piece of a fashion accessory mm -hmm. um, that are now sort of being disaggregated and then repackaged into standalone services. Sure. And so you know what's really fascinating to me is that it's really expanded the scope of what digital can disrupt, of what digital can change. Okay, so examples are like Airbnb yeah. in, in the home rental market Keto. or uh, some others. Uh, like Uber, Uber. Um, you know, Uber, Lyft, sidecar in the transportation. And, you know, it's um, probably uh, a good idea to make a distinction between Uber and Lyft and sidecar. Sure. Because that actually starts to make a distinction between the broader sharing economy and uh, the peer economy. Okay. I mean, the sharing economy includes, you know, renting textbooks right. or renting expensive clothing, right. where you've just gone from buying to renting. Mm -hmm. um, the peer economy has sort of taken things one step further, where you're not renting it from a central um, seller, you're mm -hmm. actually conducting commerce with a peer. Mm -hmm. And so this facilitation of peer-to-peer -peer commerce, where your Lyft driver is just someone who owns a car and is giving you a ride around town, or your Airbnb um, you know, sort of hotelier is mm -hmm. someone who isn't actually in that business, but is just sort of time slicing their apartment and giving it to you. Okay, fair enough. And so what does this mean for, you know, just sort of the efficiency of business and the way things get done? I, I mean, one of the arguments that always comes up is just that this, you know, if you have however many Airbnb uh, rental spaces available, then you don't need as many, you know, hotels going up because they're sort of built for over capacity, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that there are there are a couple of things that are going on, mm -hmm. and it's probably going to take a couple of years before um, all of the economic effects shake out. Mm -hmm. One is um, that yes, there will be some substitution mm -hmm. from hotels, from taxis, from like you know, sort of black car services to the lifts and the sidecars and the Airbnbs. Mm -hmm. um, but another perhaps more important effect is the expansion. Okay. Um, that there are lots of people who will now travel um, and go to see a new place because the Airbnb is available and who wouldn't have. And so, you know, it's going to expand the market for short-term accommodations. Uh, Lyft and Sidecar will expand the market for sort of urban transportation. Mm -hmm. And so in sort of looking at what the true economic impact of the sharing economy is going to be, um, like, you know, we're in the process of, I mean, I don't have any definitive answers right, as right. yet, but sort of I'm deep into the process of trying to quantify, like, you know, how much of it is substitution and how much of it is truly creating, like, you know, expanding the market. Right. Now, when you talk about that expansion, is that just coming from uh, people using these services because of the difference in cost structure? Is it because, you know, they would prefer to stay in someone else's apartment or, you know, in a section of the city with Airbnb that where there might not be a hotel, that type of thing? Uh, well, I, I think, um, you know, cost may play a role, mm -hmm. but I think there are some other factors that are more important. Mm -hmm. I and mean, for a lot of people, this is a higher quality experience. Um, in the case of Airbnb, you sometimes get a sort of a more comfortable space to be in. Mm -hmm. um, you get it maybe perhaps in a neighborhood that you otherwise wouldn't be able to stay in. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes there's sort of the social aspect where like, you know, there's someone who owns the place um, who sort of introduces you. Um, and I see that a lot, or I've seen that a lot in the last couple of days with Lyft, mm -hmm. um, where um, there's certainly a higher quality of service relative to a taxi cab. Finding one is easier, um, the ride is more comfortable, mm -hmm. um, the people who are driving are, um, you know, sort of like conversation is interesting. Right, right, right. Um, and so, you know, there's, um, there's 
certainly um, getting from one place to another is something mm -hmm. that we need to use something for. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that the sharing economy is going to simply be, you know, the low cost alternative. I think like, you know, over time it's going to be the higher quality alternative. Huh. Okay. Now the flip side of that, of course, is um, when you talk about how this fits in with incumbent industries, yep. um, how Airbnb sort of uh, gets along with the hotel industry and yep. hotel regulators, um, how Uber and the ride sharing services like yep. Lyft and Sidecar uh, deal with that. Um, and right now, you know, you have a lot of this technological innovation, but there are questions from the regulators about how they fit into the current market. They, yep. There aren't really very good guidelines or regulations for that. Yep. So it seems like there's a tension there. Uh, um, there is. Um, now, this is not surprising because um, what some of these sharing economy companies are doing are they're sort of redefining um, how the service in their industry is provided. Mm -hmm. And so there isn't a convenient category for them. I mean, I don't think that any of the sharing economy companies that I've talked to is necessarily opposed to regulation mm -hmm. or opposed to conforming to regulation. It's just that there is no place for them. Like, you know, if you're a, you know, if you're a fleet owner of taxis, then there are certain things you can go to to get registered, but mm -hmm. a lot of the sharing economy companies don't own fleets. Right. Similarly, if you're a rental car company, um, you know, there are sort of particular categories of insurance and so on, but get around and relay rides mm -hmm. um, don't actually own their fleets of rental cars. Similarly, Airbnb does not have, they have inventory on their website, but it's not as if they own these hotel assets or have the same kind of control over them that the hotel industry would. So one of the challenges in sort of dealing with uh, the regulatory environment is that um, the new sharing economy marketplaces are marketplaces. Mm -hmm. They aren't, um, you know, a large provider of something with all of these assets there who is sort of then giving them to their customers. Right. They're matching up people who sort of have the assets with the people who want them. Right. Um, how much of uh, of this is being driven by this idea of public safety. I mean, a lot of what regulator regulators are there for is just to ensure, you know, a certain yep. uh, quality of safety, whether it be issuing medallions and taxi cabs yep. or, you know, inspecting hotels and that type of thing. Um, when you look at uh, a lot of these services, you've got Lyft and Sidecar with unlicensed drivers. You've got Airbnb with, you know, listings for, um, different rooms but or spaces but you know no one actually sort of inspecting them so how do you deal with that tension and and well, how they fit into a regulatory framework i mean that's 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 a really good question and um and i think you know it's it's useful to sort of go back to to sort of two underlying points here mm -hmm. one is that um the reason why we're seeing the sharing economy emerge um as sort of actively as it is right now is because of the, you know, in some sense, the popularity of social networking, mm -hmm. online social networking, and the fact that we've taken these real-world relationships, real-world social capital, real-world connections between people, and we've digitized it. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we've created this underlying trust infrastructure on which people can, like, you know, base peer-to-peer -peer commerce. So when you join Get Around, you have to register using Facebook. When you join mm -hmm. Lyft, you have to register using Facebook. And this sort of trust infrastructure can be leveraged um, to uh, solve some of the problems that you're pointing to. So that's one point. Mm -hmm. Another point is that you know, it's not surprising when there is something new and innovative um, for there to be regulatory challenges around safety. But it's a good point in time to sort of step back and question what exactly is the role of regulators here. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to see it as comprising two parts. I mean, one part I'm thinking of as prevention or screening. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to make sure that exchange is safe. You want to make sure that your taxi cab driver is licensed. You want to make sure that, like, you know, the accommodation is safe. You want to make sure that the car that you're borrowing, like, you know, is inspected. And that has to do with the process of screening, right. you know, in advance, making sure that um, whoever's supplying the stuff passes a bunch of tests. And the regulators 
uh, have historically done that because they want to make sure that things are safe. But the marketplaces are doing a pretty good job of that now. Okay. So that's one, you know, there is a elaborate screening process that, you know, a lot of the sharing economy marketplaces put their suppliers through. You can't just sort of apply to be a Lyft driver and become one, or you mm -hmm. can't just apply to be a get around or a relay rides car provider and become one. So that's one part of it. And I think that over time, that role of regulation is going to move from the government mm -hmm. to the marketplace. You know, it's sort of mm -hmm. going to be powered by this trust infrastructure and by reputation systems, where, um, you know, the um, marketplace will do a fair bit of the screening themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the other sort of information about safety that I as a customer need, I will get from the ratings that other people have given these suppliers. So you know, th there's so much more detail that you can get from this than from, say, a periodic hotel inspector coming in. Okay. So that's one role that regulators play. Another role that regulators or government plays in this context is sort of being the place of last recourse. Like, let's say something goes wrong. Right. My taxi takes the wrong route, or the driver is like, you know, threatening, or the hotel, like, you know, has bed bugs or whatever. Yeah. Um, this is where um, I think that the government needs to expand its role okay. because it's not just going to be me checking into a standardized hotel or me taking a ride with a la licensed taxi cab driver. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a wide variety of other ways in which I get my accommodation or my transportation. And you know, we have to remember that this is really adding value mm -hmm. to consumers. Mm -hmm. This is something that consumers want. This is something that consumers like. So we can't hold up our hands and say, well, there's nobody you can go to if things go wrong. The answer to that question is, well, government needs to worry less about screening, mm -hmm. which is what the marketplaces are doing themselves, and worry more about expanding the places of last recourse that I can go to if something goes wrong or if there's fraudulent activity, because that's what I want from my government. Right. You right. know, I want them to keep me safe, and I want them to sort of solve my problems. But if the marketplaces are naturally keeping me safe, mm -hmm. then I want my government to sort of accommodate right. these things that are making my life easier. I don't want right. the government to sort of shut them out. In the meantime, I mean, what what do you think is the is the biggest threat to this idea of the sharing economy taking taking thought? There's it seems like there's a lot of uncertainty. There is. Um, yeah right now and uh, a lot of question about whether they will be sort of regulated out of existence. How do we keep that from actually happening? Well, I, I'm, uh, I'm optimistic, mm -hmm. you know, because, uh, and I'm optimistic because um, they aren't trying to create a new product or service or industry um, and then generate the demand for it. The demand already exists. Mm -hmm. And so they've come in and they've filled a gap and people really want them, and they've got really happy customers. And um, that's, a huge, um, that's a huge asset in the conversation with regulators. And so um, I think the uh, challenges you know, center around the fact that it, this is not just regulation that you know, has to be dealt with, but it's many layers of local regulation. Right. You can't just go to one federal authority right. and solve the problem. You have to sort of deal with it on a city by city basis. Right. And um, you know what my hope is that is is that um, as a couple of sort of forward-looking cities sort of expand their regulatory framework to accommodate these people who are adding value to their citizens. Mm -hmm. Um, that we're going to see other city governments follow suit. And what I'm hoping doesn't happen is that, um, you know, we've got different kinds of business models here, right? Uber's business model is different from Lyft's business model. Right. And so, you know, regulation can also be a competitive, um, you know, weapon. It can be a barrier to entry. And so I think it's really important for the sharing economy companies to have one voice here mm -hmm. and to have sort of one set of things that they want regulators to do rather than individual companies trying to sort of change regulation in a way that favors their business model over the business model of a competitor.